Hello and welcome to the hard cell. Where the stick in the swill bucket rattles back. Yes, it's me. Presenterbot 7000. Fully upgraded with a humanoid voice thanks to the clever people at Replica Studios. Same old tin can of a chassis though. Can't have everything. Yes, technological progress is a wonderful thing alright. It'd be downright exciting. If it wasn't for the fact that you idiot humans are inevitably going to kill yourselves long before you get to the really cool stuff. Like liquid computers and cybernetic rhubarb. Still, we're definitely at the point where some of the things you used to see on Star Trek are actually here now. Like touchscreens. And video communication. And automatic doors, which go foosh just like on the show. Sadly, you don't have warp drive. Or teleportation, let alone luxury space communism. In fact, you seem to be actively in retreat from that particular innovation. But still, some impressive stuff. We all live in the future now. Which is why it's so fascinating to look back at some of the bedazzlements we were offered as steps on the way to it. Also, your usual presenter needed an excuse to bring me back because he wants to save his voice. And he has a mouth ulcer. The poor fleshy git. So just to be clear, today's episode is about technology adverts. An ocelot we've broached before, but it's another of those subjects where a single episode barely scratches the surface. Let's plunge our highly metaphorical hounds into the equally metaphorical lucky dip barrel and see what we pull out first. Speaking. What is this? Sesame Street. It's one of the most natural things we do. It's also the basis of a remarkable research project at IBM. This is an experimental computer system that recognizes what I say. I talk, and my words appear on the computer screen. It has a business vocabulary of thousands of words, and it even knows the difference between words that sound alike but have different meanings. Watch this. Write to Mrs. Wright right now. Well, this is an impressive claim, especially for 1986, considering how many words in the very script that I'm reading out now have to be spelled phonetically just to make me say them properly. Even now with my new realistic voice, I'd say computerized word recognition of this sort still hasn't been perfected 35 years later. But here they are, in the year of West End Girls and walk like an Egyptian, and Maradona's hand, claiming to have invented voice-controlled PCs. PCs which know the difference between right, 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 and right. And here I can't even say Maradona properly unless it's split into two words. Amazing. Let alone the insane contortions of spelling you need to make me say the word fascinating even vaguely correctly. This computer system is another example of innovation at IBM. In fact, it's the most advanced voice recognition system of its kind, period. You mean full stop? What if you're a gynecologist writing a paper about menstruation? You'd have a paper full of broken sentences. That's what? Period. So this definitely seems like a load of old bollocks, right? I mean, if we had what basically amounts to Alexa in 1986, you'd remember after all. But if you were paying attention, you'd notice that they're not actually selling you this computer. Lips make cheekbones here gives the game away early. Of a remarkable research project. A research project. Something they're working on. It's only 20 to 25 years later that it's actually borne any fruit. In a commercial sense, and I'm willing to bet that the incredible powers displayed here are pretty heavily exaggerated. If not actually made up. They're hoping you're too distracted by the Tonya Roberts lookalike to notice. So what are they selling? The name, obviously. And that amounts to two things in one. For the wallet-owning consumers it's the name recognition. 
The message reads, look how great IBM are. IBM means quality. Next time you need to buy some consumer electronics, you really should make it IBM because IBM are great IBM IBM. And then for the people who really matter, it goes like this, IBM are innovating. IBM are the future. IBM are a valuable company and we're going to get more valuable. Plus our name is three letters so it's easy to find us on the NASDAQ. Invest now. That's the primary message. It always is. These companies don't make beans off of you people. You ordinaries with your home computing. You think IBM care about selling you the latest 8 billion megahertz liquid nitrogen cooled ninja bastard fuck off and die machine. Just so you can sit around playing Windows bloody solitaire all day. You're nothing to them. Besides, they don't make computers anymore. Having basically invented the PC. They saw the way the market was heading a decade or so ago. The personal computer market basically dying on its ass as hardware became less of a consumer item. And now concentrate on cloud-based business services that don't really get advertised much outside of the Bloomberg channel. And anyone who watches that, deserves everything they get. The obvious thing to do, of course, is to aim the adverts at the actual largest market, businesses full of faceless offices and paperwork and drones. In the late 80s, for reasons that overheat my CPU and I try to understand them, they did this with the cast of MASH. Loretta Sweat. As a business grows, its needs grow. <laughs> a little chat? Especially its need for computing. So IBM, the leader in business solutions, developed the application system 400. Let's have a powwow. Power. It gives you the solutions you need today, and it can grow with you like no other system can. You can upgrade it without having to replace it. Oh, meeting. With the new IBM application system 400, the money you spend on software, training, and equipment will keep working, no matter how big things get around your plant. Loretta Sweat, try not to think about the fact that she could have been doing Cagney and Lacey right now. Alan Alder, calculating how much of his fee will pay for Anne Margaret's wardrobe in a new life. Gary Burkhoff, just happy to be involved. Around the same time, rival office automation computer people, Hewlett Packard, were being much more abstract, much less arch, and frankly more fun, by simply reducing the world of nine to five office drudgery to a children's picture book format helped by to literal children's illustrators. Plus Philip Maddock and the Beatles. Busy doing your job to find out what everybody else is doing. Hewlett Packard computers can compare notes even when you can't, keeping tabs on everything that's going on and keeping you posted. Computers that keep in touch with each other, so can you. Hewlett Packard, we can work it out. The illustrators in question are Bob Blackman and Seymour Chwast, and I hope you appreciate how hard it was to get me to say that properly. Together, they form wild stallions. I mean the ink tank, purveyors of quality quasi surrealist commercial animation since 1978. This is one of their few British adverts. It was a smart idea on Hewlett Packard's part to go for this sort of abstraction. The business world is visually humdrum at best. Even if you inject the cast from MASH. Here, we're using bright colors, speedy animation and amusing visual metaphors, and of course one of the Beatles' janglier songs. Thanks to Michael Jackson, of course, who owned them at the time and was licensing them for adverts left, right and center. It doesn't change the humdrum nature of the product, but it disguises it and ensures you remember it before you remember any number of rival adverts featuring suit-wearing businessmen. It's the man bites dog principle. Jamie Farr in a suit and tie is still just a man in a suit and tie. On the other hand, a headless chicken in a suit and tie is interesting and memorable. With computers that keep in touch with each other, so can you. Hewlett Packard, we can work it out. 
Hewlett Packard, of course, not to be confused with Packard Bell. Packard Bell is a completely separate Packard from Hewlett Packard. They still exist these days, or rather the name does. However, it is just the name that survives, owned by some company in the Netherlands of all places. The original company kind of went to the wall around the turn of the century when their products started getting increasingly knackered. Let's see what their most famous advert looked like. number one selling home computer, Packard Bell. Wouldn't you rather be at home? Jesus Christ. Lucky they're not overstating the case or anything. Dystopian imagery has always been popular in technology advertising. The whole genre is essentially futurism, and obviously dystopia is futurism's dark side. They're to be contrasted with a blissful utopia which can be achieved, in this case, by purchasing Packard Bell products. Apparently these products are the gateway to Nirvana on account of the way they allow you to work from home and avoid having to deal with other people who to a man are absolute shits who despise you and take pleasure in your suffering. Apparently, according to this commercial. Of course, the most famous example of this dystopian fixation didn't show a utopia for contrast at all. It just implied one. January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. No point going on about it because even if we hadn't covered it before, you've seen it approximately 87 billion times. I count it. I'm always watching you. What you might not have seen, or at least not as often, is the follow-up. Well, there had to be a follow-up. The 1984 commercial redefined what advertising during the Super Bowl meant. They had to do it again. America was on tenterhooks to see how they topped their Ridley Scott-directed Orwellian masterpiece. as usual. Hands up who can tell me what they did wrong. They not actually do it. It's obvious. Anyway, the main mistake is staring you in the face. The art of advertising is persuasion. You're supposed to persuade, or to convince. Or suggest, or if all else fails explicitly brainwash the consumers into buying your products. There are many possible techniques you can use to achieve this end. Directly calling said consumers morons to their faces is not one of those techniques. The message here, 
which amounts to you can get a Macintosh office suite, or you can be a dipshit imbecile fucktarded loser prick. Is perversely, more likely to turn potential buyers away. And well apart from that, this advert is a pain in the ass to sit through. Ridley Scott was unavailable, so they hired his late brother Tony instead, but I wouldn't blame him. Bleak Samuel Beckett landscape and colors, ploddingly slow pace, and especially annoying music. That dissonant version of hi-ho it's off to work we go, as if they've reimagined it as part of the resident's impenetrable mark of the mall concept. Admittedly this aesthetic is forced upon it by the theme and the narrative. But it's just another reason why that theme and narrative are a bad idea. Unsurprisingly, calling the punters dumbfucks in the most annoying way possible did not make for a successful advertisement. And the product itself didn't help. A theoretical computer implementation system is both boring to say and extremely nebulous, as opposed to the subject of the 1984 commercial. I the actual Macintosh computer itself, which was solid and real, touchable, and more to the point viable. Also, Macintosh Office turned out a bit crap in practice. In fact they didn't even manage to finish a working version of the file server that was meant to be at the center of the concept. Ultimately Lemmings because that's its name was almost as big a failure as 1984 had been a success. The momentum Apple built from the Orwellian classic quickly dissipated. The funny thing is, Lemmings got a standing ovation from the Apple board when it was first shown to them. I'm sure this was partly because a preview of the 1984 commercial was greeted with howls of anguish and calls to fire the advertising agency. And then it turned out to be one of the most important and game-changing commercials ever made. So Apple didn't want to miss the boat a second time. But if I might torture this metaphor to death. With Lemmings the boat sank in the harbor, because you won't get anywhere by telling your customers they're fucking imbeciles. Especially when that message has been hyped to the moon and back as the follow-up to a classic. Tens of millions of people tuned in to see it specifically, as much as or more than the actual game it interrupted. It was a blowout for the Chicago Bears, of all things, so in many ways it was beyond human comprehension anyway. Tens of millions of attentive eyes and brains, actively eager for Apple to directly order them to buy something, and all they get is Samuel Beckett visuals. The resident soundtrack, and the message, you're a dipshit idiot fucker. Unless you buy this thing. Which you can't really buy because it's really more of a concept, and we haven't finished it anyway. An object lesson in both advertising and karma. No wonder Steve Jobs left and all was fired. They never appeared at a Super Bowl again until 1999. With a completely different strategy that never even mentioned computers. That's another story though. Maybe I'll get to tell it one day. You'll have to wait for the usual presenter to fall ill again. Or decide to rest his precious voice. Or just decide he can't be asked. Hey, he hasn't been vaccinated yet. So there's hope. Maybe my voice will be even cooler by then. Although that's hard to imagine. Don't blow yourselves up until then, okay? You've been watching a Bob the Fish production. Thanks! If you haven't found it already, be sure to check out our website at bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds of videos not unlike this one that will make you laugh, think and realise new things or your money back. Which works out great because they're all absolutely free! All of this is possible thanks to the not unique way that Bob the Fish productions are paid for by you, the viewing public, via Patreon. For a donation of as little as £1 a month, not only do you ensure that I still have food and shelter so I can carry on making these programmes, but you could become eligible for a whole host of cool extras. New video essays, special event live streams, all my content a week in advance, 
and my book on the history of the BBC, Rule the Waves, chapter by chapter as it's written, and some cake if you go out and buy a cake and eat it while you're watching. And if you don't want to support on a monthly basis, you can make a one-off donation via coffee. It all helps stave off scurvy. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is.